Uh, welcome. Uh, the topic for this session is what do lessons from history tell us about the future of war? Uh, and to help us explore this topic, we have three not polymaths, but technically polyhistors, <laughs> uh, historians who have uh, thought long and hard about the relationship between war, statecraft, and strategy. Uh, uh, Dr. Ian Morris of Stanford University is the author most recently of War, What Is It Good For? Uh, Sir Lawrence Friedman of King's College London. Uh, his most recent book is Strategy of History. And Philip Bobbitt of Columbia Law School is the author of The Shield of Achilles and a recent groundbreaking study of Machiavelli, The Garments of Court and Palace. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Morris. Uh, as an archeologist, as well as a historian, you've taken uh, truly the a big picture approach uh, from the Ice Age to the Industrial Era uh, and come up with some paradoxical thinking about the relationship between uh, war and politics. Uh, could you explain? Yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, um, there's this, this famous saying that Winston Churchill is supposed to have said, although uh, no one has ever been able to trace it back to an actual source. Uh, where he said, uh, the, the farther you can look back, the farther forward you're able to see. And I, I've always felt that that sort of, even if he didn't say it, it's the sort of thing he should have said. Um, because I think it's, it's true. And um, I guess, I mean, it seems to me there's sort of two big ways of trying to learn lessons from history uh, about the future. Um, one is what I think of as kind of the grab bag approach, where you look, you, you've got an idea in your head, you kind of already know what you think is going to happen. And then you look for analogies, and you look for, say, one or two cases which kind of agree with what you think. And then the other way, which is the way I try to do it, is to say, well, if you take as much history as possible, um, by which, I mean, like you say, I mean, 15,000 years, going back to the end of the Ice Age, across the whole planet. Can we see really big trends? Can we see the overall shape of history? And if we can see that, can we figure out what the forces are that have been driving this storyline? And so this is, is basically what I try to do in my work. And um, in this, this book on war, I uh, came to three main conclusions, I think, about sort of lessons that we might draw from this. And one is a sort of, a, a, like I say, a sort of paradoxical conclusion, um, which is that, uh, well, trespassing slightly now into the, the territory of the next panel, where, where Stephen Pink is going to be talking, I think one of the big trends in world history has been um, declining rates of violent death. That if we'd lived in the Stone Age, we would be 10 times likelier to die violently than we are today, which is a huge transformation. But I think the, the great paradox of this story is that the, the force that's driven this, like, like Hobbes recognized in the 17th century, has been the rise of states and governments um, that kind of raise the costs for people of using violence. Because like, if you, you ask me a difficult question, we get into an argument, I pull out a knife and cut your throat, I'm going to pay a price for this. And there's sort of, there's no, in the world we now live in, there's no way the benefits from murdering you because you asked a question I couldn't answer are ever going to be greater than the costs I will pay for doing it. So you know, people in the modern world, are, are, complex, powerful governments have learned not to use force very much to settle their arguments compared to what went on through, through most of history. And so I think the big force has been the rise of great powerful states, making it more and more difficult for people to use violence to, to get what they want from the world, and people have started to use violence less. Um, but uh, that is a very broad conclusion. I think one potential implication is we might be, we maybe can afford to be optimistic. I think this trend might continue uh, across the next century. Um, but I think a couple of other general lessons I thought we could draw from this big story. And um, one is about the small wars that we've seen you know, so much of in the last 20, 25 years. And I think this is not, not a new phenomenon. I think any time you get a great power that really dominates the stage it operates on and raises the costs of using violence um, for, for other competitors, you tend to see a lot less interstate warfare. This is true, say, of the Roman Empire, true to some extent of the, the British world system in the 19th century. Um, the costs of using violence go up. Potential rivals near peers are less inclined to use violence, but you still get lots of small actors, sort of asymmetrical actors, saying, well, yeah, of course the great power could come and crush us completely, but they're not going to. I mean, they're not going to nuke us. They're not going to put 100,000 troops on the ground to crush us. So we're going to give it a try uh, and see what happens. And I think you see you know, some very similar patterns in the later Roman Empire, in the late 19th century with the British, as, as to what we've seen in the last 
couple of decades. And then the final thing, though, the, the final conclusion I felt I could come to was about great wars. And because a lot of people have been saying, well, we're in an age now where great power war is just off the table, never going to happen. And I would say that the long-term lessons of history are, don't point in that direction. Um, the one thing, again, we see over and over again is when you get a, a truly great power dominating its stage, the stage it operates on, one of the things you see happening is that it kind of creates its own rivals. It creates this peaceful inter international scene which allows space for other groups to become powerful and wealthy. You create your own rivals. I think British very much did this with Germany and the US in the late 19th century. And um, uh, I noticed yesterday when people were talking about potential threats facing the US, there were names of one or two countries that conspicuously never got mentioned. So perhaps this is some rule we're all supposed to abide by. But so I, I won't say what the obvious candidates are for the great there, powers there no we've helped create. <laughs> but I mean, I think you, know, you can perhaps see something rather similar happening again now in the early 21st century. The success of the US in creating this um, you know, world scale um, system of free trade has created new rivals to the US. And if the script of history does rerun itself, uh, I think one thing we'll see is people increasingly losing confidence in the ability of the Leviathan to continue playing the role of Leviathan, being more and more tempted, like a Germany 100 years ago, more and more tempted to try to solve their problems by violence. Uh, and if that is the way things go, then um, I think that the, the trend toward a more peaceful world might not be, in fact, a permanent one. Well, thank you. Uh, Sir Lawrence, in your book, Strategy, uh, you have an interesting definition of strategy as the art of creating power. Uh, and in connection with that, what, what do you think are lessons, if any, of history for strategy? Um, okay, well, well, first, on the lessons of history, I don't think history isn't a syllabus. Uh, uh, it's, people don't do things for didactic purposes. Uh, they, do, they do things because they have choices and they, and they make decisions and things turn out in particular ways. So my approach is that you can learn from history, uh, but don't claim that history has lessons that are universal, that, that, that uh, uh, can guide every action. Uh, second point, just relating to the, the topic of uh, what does it teach us about the future of war. Um, the problem of any attempt to uh, determine the future of war um, and there's been some spectacular failures in the past uh, it, when people have attempted to discern the future of war. And that's one thing a historian can tell you, uh, is that people keep on getting it very wrong, is because it depends on choices that are being made or have not yet been made. Um, we don't, we're not destined to a particular future. Uh, there are forces at work, there are, there are structures, there are demographic trends, uh, there are material limitations, uh, but we have choices. Uh, and we have decisions, and that's where strategy comes in. So um, uh, my approach to strategy, and again, this comes from having written a very large history of it, um, is that uh, one of the things you, you look at is people, sometimes strategies are successful, sometimes they're not, um, but the unintended consequences are often as important as the intended consequences. Um, that if people said, a, you know, when you're told, uh, any of you have been told we must have a strategy, the first thing you're probably said is, describe what you're trying to achieve and then work out how to achieve it. Uh, but actually, very rarely do you achieve what you set out to achieve. Um, because things happen, people, people, have the, people you're dealing with have their own strategies, it becomes a muddle, uh, and you suddenly see an opportunity that you didn't realize was there before, so you go off and do something else. Uh, mean, uh, uh, and so, actually, strategy is a process of adaption and flex. A good strategy seems to be adapt by adaption and flexibility, uh, and being aware that the things that you weren't expecting are going to be as important as the things uh, that, that you were expecting. So that leads into the idea. Uh, well, first, one sort of ideas of the book, which is that uh, don't think of strategy as a plan. Um, because the idea of a plan is a series of sort of sequential steps that takes you uh, to where you want to be, uh, but doesn't actually allow for people who are actively trying to disrupt your plan and have got their own plans. Um, and the famous von Moltke quote of uh, uh, no plan survives contact with the enemy, 
uh, or my favorite, the Mike Tyson quote, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the throat. Um, uh, and um, so that uh, instead of thinking about plans, you've got to think about it as something much more active and engaged with others. And that the, uh, so the definition of, of the art of creating power comes out of, I think, um, attention in the use of the word power. So when we talk about somebody as being powerful, we normally talk about that in terms of uh, assets. We've got great military strength, great economic strength, soft power, everybody thinks you're terribly interesting or what, uh, and uh, wishes to emulate you or whatever soft power is. Um, uh, and then there's a specific application. Uh, so what I'm interested in with strategies is specific applications uh, where your general power may turn out to be absolutely useless to the circumstances in which you find yourself, despite the fact that you've called yourself powerful. Um, so the strategy is the difference looking at a, uh, an encounter between what you might expect, just looking at the relative balance of the general power, and actually what transpires. Strategy is what is the value added, if you like, what, what makes the difference. Um, and I found this is a reasonably serviceable definition. Um, but you have to have a particular view of power to make it work, so that's why you need to read the book. Um, <laughs> the, um, just a, just a, another point that comes from that, what makes for good strategy? Again, historically, I would argue that there's a great tendency amongst people interested in strategy to want to, make, to, want to be clever and cunning. Um, this is why Sun Tzu is so popular because he's basically saying you can outsmart your enemy even if he's bigger than you, which is fine unless your opponent has also read Sun Tzu uh, and, uh, is and then you never engage at all because you're all doing indirect approaches and you <laughs> go off in opposite directions. So um, my view is, if you just look back, is what makes the difference is coalitions, alliances. Uh, if, you're not that, if you're not as strong as somebody else, find somebody to work with you who can builds you up. So, uh, and I think in this country it's important to stress this because um, actually what makes the United States the great power it is, is its network of alliances. Take that away and why would the United States be bothering with a lot of the things it's doing? Uh, and the reason that the United States is a more important power in China is China doesn't have a network of alliances, nor is it likely to develop one. So you need to look at coalition and, line and alliances to understand the potential of strategy. So just a sort of final observation, seeing um, Ian started with Churchill. I'll end on Churchill. Uh, we always have to quote Churchill at least once. And then if you want to be positive, you quote Churchill. If you want to be negative, you quote Hitler. Um, uh, we, we just can't escape from the Second World War. Um, but Churchill... Um, when he came to power in, um, in terrible circumstances in, in May 1940 uh, and looked at the predicament that Britain was in, um, his first, you know, he didn't have a, an end point at the time, but basically the issue was survival and endurance. And you know, you've got to remember that a lot of strategy is, uh, is nothing about setting out yourself great initiatives that you're going to achieve. It's just hanging in there. And that, and that was what strategy was about. But in the long term, uh, the first thing he did was to make contact with President Roosevelt, uh, which his predecessor had notably failed to do. Uh, and that when Pearl Harbor happened, he said, so we have won. He uh, knew we hadn't won. Uh, there was time to go. But the, 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 a coalition had been formed uh, that was not going to be beaten. And when uh, Hitler fully, I mean, strategy 101, don't invade Russia. Uh, uh, when Hitler, Hitler did it, um, uh, and this great anti-Bolshevik found himself um, uh, uh, sort of ribbed in the House of Commons. He said, if, if Hitler had invaded Hades, I'd have a good word to say for Satan uh, in the House of Commons. He understood the importance of coalition. Um, and I think, you know, if there's one point that the, the, the book tries to bring out is uh, sometimes you can outsmart your opponent, sometimes being cleverer works, but actually, by and large, getting more strength than they have is, is a pretty good recipe. And the best way to do that, if you start off weaker, is to find a friend. Well, you make that point in your book where you quote the Bible mm. saying, the race goeth not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. 
that Damon And then you, you quote the American writer Damon Runyon, who said, but that's where the smart money is. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to bet. <laughs> Uh, Professor Bobbitt, uh, what do you think the main feature of the future of war will be? <clears throat> it will be surprising. And I say that not because the future is unpredictable, which it is, or uncertain, which it is. Uh, in fact, I say that because that is what is predictable and certain. The future of warfare will be surprising for two reasons. One, a general reason that's always true and then one specific to this generation. The general reason is that because we cannot, even a country as wealthy as ours, uh, defend against every vulnerability, we try and defend those vulnerabilities that are likeliest to be attacked or perhaps those whose loss would be most significant for us. By doing that, we push our adversaries into unexpected areas. They attack us in those arenas where we least expect it because we have defended those areas where we most expect an attack. So the future of war will be surprising. In January 2001, the hart rudman Commission uh, gave its final report. It's hard to imagine a more distinguished group of people, a very sophisticated group with quite a wide array of advisors. The report uh, missed global networked terror completely. The report missed hybrid warfare, the mix of insurgency, terrorism, cyber war, and conventional war that tends to sort of paralyze alliance structures, the importance of which Professor Friedman was very right to stress. The report missed the fragility of our financial institutions and the fact that our increasing wealth is tied to our increasing vulnerability. Why? Because in each of those areas, America's strengths had pushed our adversaries into unexpected areas, into novel alliances of their own, novel arrangements, novel points of attack. So the eternal reason is war will be surprising because we make it surprising. And that should be no surprise. <laughs> the specific reason for uh, the generation of young people I see in the room here is that we do live, as you so often hear, uh, at a pivotal moment. But what you rarely hear is why it is pivotal. For the last 150 years or so, we have lived in the constitutional order of industrial nation states. This was an order uh, conceived and uh, innovated by Lincoln in this country, by Bismarck in Germany, a constitutional order that challenged the imperial states of the 19th century, another constitutional order that had also dominated for more than a century. If you think that you live in nation states that are Westphalian states that were basically founded in 1648, then I think you are living in a delusion that will blind you to what is really novel and what is really pivotal about this time. We do not live in kingly states, the constitutional order that originated at Westphalia and was ratified by those two treaties. We don't live in princely states, the first modern states that preceded kingly states. We don't live in imperial states or territorial states. We live in industrial nation states, and their pedigree is not as ancient or as distinguished as we pretend. Once you've freed your mind from the idea that the constitutional order is eternal in the modern era, you'll be more sensitive to see what changes are underway now that are bringing about a change in that order and what the new order will look like. You will see a state that is more devolved, more decentralized, more favorable to nationalism, outsources and privatizes its activities, that is global, and that is networked. This is partly a consequence of changes in warfare, but it will also drive changes in warfare. And warfare for the 21st century will be more devolved, 
decentralized, more networked, more informational, more outsourcing, more privatized, and more global. It will also be more nationalistic and more ethnic. Those uh, shouldn't be surprising to us, except that we, we don't expect it. None of the really important books on the future of the 21st century that were written in the end of the 20th century even discuss the state. The state is held constant, and just the furniture of economics and representation is moved around. Most of the time, that's a wise assumption. It won't be true now. Things will be changing in a way that is both uh, surprising and momentous. Well, thank you. I think uh, what is interesting from all of these comments is the omission of what are usually thought of as lessons of history mm -hmm. for foreign policy of the kind uh, that are frequently invoked here in Washington, D.C., where we have what I, I think of as the Potomac School of History uh, with four lessons. Uh, there's the lesson of Sarajevo, which is that world wars can start completely by accident. There's the lesson of Munich, which is you can never negotiate with your adversaries. There's the lesson of Vietnam, which is escalation will lead to a quagmire. Mm. And then the fourth lesson is that all adversaries are just like Hitler. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's the instrumental promiscuous way to use or rather abuse history in policy debates. Uh, you know, if you're addressing policymakers, and we'll go in reverse order, uh, because it's not that you're going to leave history out of debate, it's already in there, uh, some conception of, of, of where we are. And, uh, is there a way that policymakers who are not academics can think in a clear way, uh, other than simply reaching for this metaphor or that metaphor, you know, ransacking the past, uh, to start in reverse order with Professor Bobbitt? Well, I think there is, of course, but, uh, but your approach to this, I think, is wiser than, than uh, my telling you how to do it. How not to do it seems to me to be uh, the better part of wisdom here. Uh, we reach for analogies and metaphors to shore up the ideas that we already have, and that's, that's fine. Uh, that's a natural, uh, a natural form of language. But then we can reach into the same toolbox and extract lessons for the future is uh, a, a, an idle pursuit. Anytime you hear someone say, history teaches us that, you should look at your watch, think about your wife, your husband, <laughs> wonder what your children are up to. Uh, but you needn't uh, pay any further attention. Uh, uh, Professor Friedman? You're exactly right um, that, you know, when people are talking about the lessons of history, they mean Munich. Uh, and uh, what actually they're doing is saying, I really don't think we should be talking to the Iranians. Gosh, this reminds me of Munich. Um, and then it's as useful as, as Neville Chamberlain uh, in terms of time saying, you know, this reminds me of uh, how the Union dealt with secession because that's the distance between the two. I mean, as if there's no other interesting diplomatic history uh, between 1938 and now that we could look to to understand how you might deal with it. But that's not what they're trying to do. It's basically a shorthand for making a point. It's not actually using history mm -hmm. to illuminate situations, draw comparisons. If you do that, it can be quite interesting. Um, there's a book that just came out of Harvard that, that uh, because a year ago people were, were saying, this is 1914, what's going to produce a great war uh, in 2014? Why? It could be the United States and China. Uh, uh, and Prime Minister Abe was foolish enough to make the comparison, so Harvard's produced a book uh, with lots of distinguished people on the First World War, experts on the First World War, writing very interesting stuff about the First World War, about which there is no consensus about how it started and why. Uh, so, uh, and Katie, well, it's actually quite different. So uh, it was a perfectly sensible conclusion, but it's not very exciting. But it, it does illuminate the, the, the differences. What you want policymakers to do with history is read it. Find out about the places they're about to invade. Um, <laughs> uh, 
you know, rec <laughs> recognize these the people who have been there before and had trouble. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's what history is good for, context, uh, background. Um, uh, you, know, you don't have to say that you know, what, what the British experienced in the early 20s is how the America uh, of the last century is, is how the Americans are going to experience Iraq now, but at least know that these things happened and it's part of the memory of those countries and the culture of those countries. So rather than um, you know, ramsack history to find examples, as Philip suggested, that support whatever position you'd come to beforehand anyway, um, uh, taking events out of context, learn, uh, do your learning from history by reading it and actually uh, investing the time to understand the particularities of situations and the choices that people made. Um, because I come, you know, come back to the, my, my starting point, that uh, you know, just going back to 1914, um, you know, I mean, the big review of, uh, of all the different books on 1914, what you come down to is some absolutely terrible decision making. And people had choices and they made the wrong ones. Uh, you couldn't predict that. Uh, if, if they'd been faced with a similar set of choices but a year, early, a year later, they'd have probably turned out different. But that's how it happened at the time. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that you can do from just learning your history. Uh, Professor Morris, uh, should there be a historical Hippocratic oath, do no harm, <laughs> by misusing history? Oh, I think all the historians would have been fired by now if we had that. Um, but yeah, I think my, my, my learned colleagues have already, I think, made, made all the smart points about this, so I can be, be pretty brief. But I think, um, yeah, I mean, logicians will often say there's, sort of, there's two kinds of analogies you can make when you're comparing things. And one is, they'll say, is the formal analogy, where, uh, which I think is a, the, the sort of thing you were both uh, casting aspersions on where you say, oh, God, it's always 1938. We are always across the table from Adolf Hitler. Um, therefore, we must do X, whatever my chosen sort of pet rock happens to be. We must do that, um, which is not always a very good way to proceed. Uh, and then the second way they'll say is what they'll call a relational analogy, where instead of saying you go to the past to plunder it for the example that supports my case, you'll say you go to the past to try to see how things fit together, what the relations were, and you'll be as interested in the differences as in the similarities. And so may maybe you will want to talk about 1938, but you say, well, how is our situation here different from what Chamberlain and Hitler were confronting? Um, are there things we could do which, will, which Chamberlain didn't do, which will lead to a better outcome? And that's the way I think we should be thinking about history. But again, it does sort of come back to the, the point that Lawrence was making, that you, you need to know some history to do this. You can't just go with the, the, one line, the, you know, the four points you know, in Potomac School of History. We've got time for some questions. Uh, any uh, questions from the audience? Uh, yes, way in the back, if uh, we could get a microphone there. Mohamed Benoun with Human as Global. Uh, this question might be a follow-up on what Mr. Bobbitt said, but I'd like to direct it to all the panelists. Uh, in today's uh, international system and international law, uh, we have, we're trying to box sovereignty within territorial boundaries. But we see actors like ISIS trying to uh, erase territorial boundaries. Russia, by its actions, is ignoring its boundaries, its, its uh, territory. Do we see uh, the territorial system as being a lasting trend in history, or is it fading away? Uh, Professor Bobbitt, would you like to start? <clears throat> I'd say a bit of both. Uh, the, the real leap occurs from uh, a feudal world to the first modern states. And so our terms of international law, four states, personality, identity, integrity, sovereignty, continuity, are all terms that were applied to the person of a prince and are then uh, transformed into the uh, structure of an immortal state. Territoriality is part of that, but just as your question implies, uh, we can already see markets in territoriality and sovereignty. The European Union being a great example. When Turkey was applying with more hope than perhaps it has now to become a member, the European Union said, as a sovereign state, you are entitled to have capital punishment. And we're not trying to interfere with that, but if you want to join this union, you'll have to renounce that. 
Now that's a market in sovereignty. And one can easily imagine states that have uh, legal structures that are extraterritorial and or like uh, the sovereign status, the semi-sovereign status of Indian tribes that are non-territorial. Uh, Sir Lawrence? Uh, there's an enormous variety of uh, state formations now. Um, the European state system is very different, it seems to me, in all sorts of ways from the Asian one, different again from the Middle Eastern one, uh, and so on. Um, but it's worth starting, the starting point is most territory is now spoken for. Um, uh, and the, it's pretty clear who does own it, uh, where, where, the, where the boundaries are set. And what you have are a series of challenges. Um, ISIL describes itself as a state. I mean, it, it's, it's not suggesting it's something, it, how it imagines this state will actually develop and function, who knows. Um, Russia, while uh, being aggressive, uh, is still working within the terminology um, and the pretense uh, that actually it's following international law and that these are uh, autonomous movements desperate for a degree of self-determination. Um, uh, and maybe it's making it up as it goes along, um, but it, ha it hasn't broken away from the ways of thinking of, of, of the traditional international system in terms of how it presents. So what we're seeing is a series of different types of challenges and different types of probes, which will leave the system, it leaves the system every month, every year, looking a little different. Um, I think the, the ISIL challenge uh, is essentially not so much their concept of a new state system, but the breakdown of one that existed beforehand where actually it almost had the characteristics of the one that Philip was describing from olden times of, uh, of a, well, a strong man dominated particular states. And all those strong men have gone. And now some strong men are trying to, all men, uh, are trying to uh, recreate it in Egypt and so on. But that seems to me it's the, it's the collapse of an old Middle East uh, that's created what's going on rather than the creation necessarily of a new one. Right, to comment? Um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, the territorial states have not always been with us. I mean, they're about 5,000 years old, and there, there's no reason to think they're, they're going to go on forever. Uh, I think the, the modern nation state version of the territorial state was a very good solution to a lot of the problems um, governments in Europe were facing in the 19th century. But now we're facing different problems, and so new forms of organization are becoming increasingly popular and uh, influential, and we're seeing a sort of nibbling away, I think, of the, the territorial state, from, both from you know, supra-state organizations like the UN and the European Union, and from below by NGOs and you know, characters like the Islamic State um, in the Middle East. But I think with the Islamic State, I mean, they, they do call themselves Islamic State, but they also like to say they're a new caliphate. And a caliphate is not a state in the sense in which we think of it. And I think often people will dismiss some of these claims they're making to be a caliphate, which is as much a religious organization as a state. But I think we should actually take them more seriously. I think a lot of the things that, I mean, you know, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi takes his name from Abu Bakr, the first caliph, and a lot of the things they're trying to do really are strikingly relevant reminiscent of what the original caliphs did. And it's a, it's a different kind of organization. Um, and so, yeah, I think the, the question was absolutely right. We're, I think we are seeing the, the transformation of, of the current system of territorial states. One word I would like to see banished is non-state actor. I think this confuses more than it clarifies because it confuses radically different groups, some which are like international drug traffickers or, you know, perhaps some uh, militant movements like anarchists that have no political ambitions. Uh, and it, it conflates these with revolutionary movements, which are non-state actors only until they can seize power right. in a state. And then they don't, and, and it's just like terrorism. At, at that point, they can cease being terrorists because mm -hmm. they have an army and a navy and you know, police and, and border security. So the German National Socialist Workers' Party was a non-state actor until 1933. Mm -hmm. It then became a state. Uh, Lenin's communists were non-state actors in, until uh, the October uh, Revolution in 1917. Uh, and particularly if you look at uh, uh, these groups, which I think are best described as Salafist jihadists, mm. 
you know, these are revolutionaries. We've sort of dropped the word revolution, but these are revolutionary political ideologies that seek state power if they can get it. We have uh, uh, one more question right up here, front row. Uh, do we have a, uh, the microphone is coming. What time is it? I'm Harlan Ullman. I really want to provoke the panel. Um, you talk about uncertainty, obviously, and unpredictability, and you can argue that uh, economists have predicted 5,000 of the last two um, recessions. But some people have been fairly predictive about future war. 1929, the Navy War Games, Rear Admiral Ernie King made the attack uh, that was replicated by the Japanese in World War II. The Navy was very good in thinking about World War II. The Army War College in the interwar years was very good thinking about the same thing. You read Guderi and you read uh, De Gaulle and so forth. Um, we had a movie. If, if you can bring it to a question. I'm going to bring it to a time. question in a second. You, you, we had a movie that predicted the events of September 11th and even the, the Rudman Hart panel predicted a terrorist attack on the United States. They were wrong by 19 years and six months. So you have um, predictability here. How do you examine that and make sure that what appears to be good predictions about the future can indeed be launched into a policy arena, or is that just too difficult? Anyone want to take this? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> thinking about the future is immensely valuable. I worked for a while with the Shell Global Scenarios, who have a, a, a marvelous team that every few years puts together these uh, scenarios for the future. But thinking about the future and knowing what the future is going to be are two very different uh, activities. Thinking about the future is like a, a safe cracker filing down his fingertips. It just makes you more sensitive to things that are happening on the horizon and prevents you from assimilating them in kind of a complacent way to what's going on now. Uh, but predicting the future is, 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 I think, a real snare. When Laurie was talking about the flexible nature of successful strategies. I was thinking about a, a parallel in chess. Most chess players have a favorite opening that they, they master and they study responses to the opening. But some chess players simply open up the center, uh, try and control it, protect the king, and see what happens. Other responses? Yeah. Um, the difficulty, I mean, you can always find e examples um, of people who uh, were pretty apparently very prescient. We also have to look at all the other things they were saying at the time as well. Um, so I'll just take two great examples. H.G. Uh, Wells, who people would argue is sort of the founder of modern futurology, who talked about the atom bomb. Um, uh, but he also described the First World War as the war to end all wars. Um, and uh, some of the things he said just seem amazing and spot on uh, when, you, when you read his books now. Some of them just seem absolutely ludicrous. Herman Kahn, who, who was another one who used to produce these sort of lists of futures, uh, and he had the exact date right in 1960 or something, maybe 62, of when the US would put a man on the moon and all sorts of things. But the other uh, prediction was just completely balmy. So um, uh, <coughs> looking back, you can say, gosh, if only we'd paid attention to that, but you'd then have to ignore all the other stuff and know that that was the prediction right. that was likely to come right. So it's a, it, it's a, it's a difficult game. I agree with Phil that, that basically you need to think, and of course a, a, a responsible government needs, needs to prepare, needs to ex recognize that there are contingencies um, and some of these are pretty obvious. Um, there's a, the, 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 some of you will know of a, a great British civil servant, Michael Quinlan, who, who was uh, um, uh, eventually ended up leading our Ministry of Defence, who observed that the, re the real problem with defence planning uh, is things that you prepared for didn't happen precisely because you prepared for them. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and and the, the things that uh, you, you hadn't prepared for, they were the things that happened precisely because you hadn't prepared for Well, those sound like genuine lessons of history. No, that's yeah. a lesson of history uh, for you. Dr. Morris, last word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just uh, yeah, very quickly. Um, yeah, I think that the, the most valuable thing about making the predictions is the, the way it forces you to think about the assumptions you're making. And this is something I, I learned actually from talking to, to financial planners, um, that there's any number of possible predictions you can make about how the markets are likely to behave in the future on the basis of how they behaved in the past, varying wildly, with sometimes very small shifts in the assumptions. And it's you know, like the old saying about, you know, plans are useless, but planning is all important. It's the, the process of thinking about what assumptions am I making? I think that's where the, the sort of drawing lessons from the past and predict, projecting them forward, that's where I think it comes in most useful. Our distinguished historians agree with Yogi Berra that prediction is hard, especially about the future. Please join me in thanking them. <laughs>